Cognition is the process of acquiring, storing, and retrieving information. So it's like taking advantage of those memories we talked about in the previous video. <coughs> you could also just simply define cognition as thinking. Now, in cognitive psychology, we study thinking, or we study different kinds of thinking. We study things like concepts, mental imagery, language, problem solving, and creativity. And the next few videos, we're going to talk about each one of these different topics. So let's talk about concepts. Concepts are mental representations of a category, class, or just group of objects, people, or events, or other things. Uh, the purpose of having concepts seems to be to help us organize our thinking, to like classify the various important things in our lives. It definitely assists us in our ability to communicate efficiency, efficiently and effectively. A shorter definition of the term concept could simply be an idea that represents a group of objects or events. For example, if I, if I ask you to think of a cat, you know, it's all the different ideas, all the different knowledge and the previous experiences that come to mind, that comprises your cat concept. So for me, when I imagine a cat, I imagine something like this. So this, this is what I would say is my, my cat concept. This is what it would look like. Now, the way we get these concepts is through two basic methods. So there's two kinds of concepts. You, you can develop concepts in a more formal way. So these are concepts that are clearly defined by a set of rules or some kind of formal definition. These are the kinds of concepts that you generally learn in school. You know, like the fact that a triangle has three sides. And then there's the more common way that people develop their concepts, the natural way. So natural concepts are acquired just through our everyday experiences. You know, moving, going around the world, interacting with things, you know, experiencing the consequences of our actions. These are the ways that we just kind of classify objects as belonging to certain groups. So, for example, you might be traveling someday and you encounter some strange object. You've never experienced it before, but it, it might be a kind of fruit. And you try it, and then you realize, yes, this is part of the fruit concept. So now you do, you, you've kind of grown your concept. You've made it bigger. What you've done by, you know, naturally kind of assimilating this new object into your fruit concept is you've actually helped form that concept. And that's how we do all kinds, that's how we form all of our concepts is just by building them up with more, you know, what we would call positive instances, while also kind of making them more defined, making them more clear, by simultaneously identifying the things that don't belong. Those would be the negative instances. So we're simultaneously f trying to figure out what belongs to each of our concepts and what doesn't. And we usually do this by some kinds of, you know, conceptual rules, like with fruits, one of the most common rules people have for determining something as being a fruit is that, first of all, it's not an animal, and secondly, it has like a sweet taste, and thirdly, it has seeds. So those are individual concepts, and that's how you build your individual concepts, but we also have a, a, like a higher level of conceptual organization. And what I'm saying is we have categorical concepts. So we have concepts that are made up of you know lower level concepts if you want to think of it that way so here's what i mean by that cat is kind of a broad thing there's many kinds of cats but cat itself is just part of the category that we call mammals now mammal would be an example of a taxonomic category because all the animals in the mammal group are related in terms of their 
you know, form and functions. So all the concepts that belong to the group mammal, that category of mammal, have that kind of visual and functional similarity. You could also do this kind of categorization through just the concepts having some kind of shared significance or some form of interaction. Like if I ask you to think of farm equipment, you're probably going to be thinking of many different kinds of things. You know, maybe like a scythe and a tractor and, you know, all those other things that are stereotypical on a farm. But none of these things look the same. None of these things do the same functions. Each one of them is unique. And in many cases, they interact. So whether you use the more taxonomic kind of categorization or the more thematic categorization is really kind of a preference thing. And what the research has shown is that there definitely seems to be a correlation with your level of education. So if you've been in school a lot and if you are currently in school, then you're much more likely to use taxonomics. Because these are the kinds of things that we, you know, like learn in our biology classes. You know, we learn about mammals, we learn about reptiles and all that stuff. So it, this whole idea of grouping based on form and function is kind of drilled into our heads. But people who don't go to school or who have never gone to school, they tend to kind of lean more towards the thematic because that definitely seems to be a more naturalistic way to associate various kinds of concepts. But here's an example of how they did this kind of research. So what you see here is a target image. And they were shown a target image similar to this. And then asked the question, which of the two choices shown below goes with this target? So just take a minute and think about which one of these two objects goes with the target. Now, if you picked choice A, then I would say that's the thematic choice, because these two objects interact, obviously. But if you picked choice B, now that's the more taxonomic choice because, you know, the target and choice B are obviously in the same kind of, you know, taxonomic category. And by just doing experiments like this, that's how they were able to find out, you know, that because of things like education, people tend to lean more towards taxonomic. Now, each individual concept also has two different kinds of meanings. They have a denotative meaning, or a denotative meaning. This, you can think of this as just like a dictionary definition. It's the exact, you know, meaning of a concept. It's objective. So you can look that up in a dictionary to see, you know, if you're correct in your denotative meaning. But all concepts also have a connotative meaning, and that means something personal, something subjective. It's your like emotional uh, feelings towards that concept. So for each one of your concepts, you have uh, a prototype. So a prototype would be just like the ideal model that we use as a prime example of a concept. In the beginning of the video, I asked you to think of uh, a cat. So that image that came to mind for you when, when I tell you to think of a cat, the image that comes to mind imi at immediately, that's your prototype for cat. And if I ask you to think of something else like a cup or a shirt, the first thoughts that come to mind, the first ideas that come to mind, that's your prototypes for those objects. So the prototypes are going to embody what you consider to be the most typical features. Something kind of similar to prototypes are stereotypes. So I know, I know, since, you know, grade school, it's been drilled into your head that stereotypes are bad. Well, stereotypes aren't bad by on their own. Star stereotypes aren't good either. They're just stereotypes. It's just how the brain functions. So the truth is we stereotype all the time. And that's because it's actually helpful for us to stereotype on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, stereotypes, these are just cognitive schemas. They're like mental shortcuts that allow us to easily and quickly process information about an object based on its membership to a group. So, like I said, 
we use them all the time. Uh, every time you get up in the morning and you go into the kitchen, you'll pick up an object that you've pro you may have never seen before, and you'll eat it because you have certain expectations as to what the nutritional value is going to be, uh, how it's going to make you feel after you eat it, how it's going to taste. Those uh, so you, you're making all these assumptions. You're making all these kind of prejudiced assumptions simply based on the fact that this object looks similar to objects you've eaten before. So obviously this can be very helpful. I mean if we always approach objects that we haven't seen before as brand new things that we have no knowledge of, it would take us forever to accomplish anything. Instead, you know, we can operate fairly efficiently. But the problem with stereotypes arises when you start applying them incorrectly, when you start applying them in a too broad of a sense. And they, it especially becomes a problem when you apply stereotypes to people. So social stereotypes are stereotypes that are applied to groups of people. And you can develop a social stereotype towards any kind of group. So it could be a racial group, it could be a religious group, it could be uh, a nation nationality, you know, whatever. I if you can group people based on some kind of similarity, you can have a stereotype for that. Now, what I th consider to be one of the worst parts of stereotypes, what I consider to be one of the most damaging and hurtful aspects of social stereotypes is called stereotype conformity. And that just refers to the fact that when people are aware of stereotypes that are applied to them, when they're aware of stereotypes that uh, apply to their group, they'll feel pressured to kind of act in accordance with that stereotype. They'll feel pressured to kind of meet those expectations. They may not actually, you know, meet those expectations. They might resist the pressure, but they definitely feel that social influence and it kind of just makes them uncomfortable. It makes them doubt themselves. 